For thousands of years, human beings have argued about what free will is. Do we even have it? Actually, there's a strong argument that we don't because for many generations, people thought the laws of physics were completely deterministic. So if everything's determined beforehand, how can we have free will? If I decide this afternoon, it's four o'clock, should I have a cup of coffee or should I have a cup of decaffeinated coffee? Well, a cup of coffee would be more exciting, but a cup of decaffeinated coffee might be uh, a safer bet later on in the evening. Am I actually making that decision or has it been determined beforehand? In fact, one of the most famous examples of free will goes back to Lucretius in his De Rerum Naturae, on the nature of things, this beautiful epic poem of the Roman era in which he's expounding on um, uh, the uh, on atomism and the theory of Democritus. So Lucretius says, well, everything is completely deterministic and the atoms bounce into each other in a deterministic fashion, but every now and then one of them gives a slight unpredictable swerve. And then he says, why do we have this unpredictable swerve? He says, because if we didn't have that, then we couldn't have free will. We wouldn't have the ability to make decisions that were not determined beforehand. Of course, there's another perspective about free will, which says that even if things are determined or even mechanistic, then we could still have free will. This argument is at the center of a current debate that goes on in neuroscience. So in neuroscientists, scientists of the brain are now getting to the point where they can look at the signals that are coming out of your electrodes that are patched into neurons in your brain, and they claim that they can figure out what decision you're going to make a split second before you do it. So, you know, that split second before I say, I'm going to go with the caffeinated coffee. They already knew that that's what I was going for. I'm going for the, the jitters and not the calm. Well, so in fact, you read in, in books about neuroscience these days that neuroscientists have proved that we don't have free will. Is that so? I don't know. But I do know one thing. And I actually will now describe a mathematical theorem that proves that whether we have free will or not, so whether you think we have free will or not, what is really the essence of free will, which is before we make the decision, do we know what we're going to do? Do we know the decision we're going to make? I will can prove mathematically that we cannot know what we're going to decide. So all the time that I'm sitting there saying, hmm, calf or decaf, and I don't know what decision I'm going to make, then even if some neuroscientist, or for that matter my wife, knows beforehand if I'm going to get the caffeinated coffee, I myself can't know what I'm going to do. So if you think about decisions you have to make, this is in some sense what makes our will seem free. It's a very important part of free will, if not the essence of free will. Why do we think that our will is free? Because uh, prior to actually making the decision, it seems to us, the decision maker or the decider, in the words of George W. Bush, a former president, uh, in the, the, uh, the, the decider does not know what the decision is. There's some, been some wonderful things written about about free will over the years. So Samuel Johnson, the English dictionary maker, uh, summarized the debate between Locke and Hume in the 18th century about free will saying, all theory militates against the freedom of will, but all experience speaks for it. And then at another point he said, our will's free and that's the end to it. <laughs> but you can't necessarily actually get at free will just by saying that we have free will. So in fact, at the beginning of the 20th century, when quantum mechanics was introduced, in quantum mechanics, there are intrinsically chancy events. You, know, you have an electron that shows up here or shows up there, completely random whether it shows up here or there. And at that point, Sir Arthur Eddington said, ah, physics at last withdraws its objections to the freedom of will. But wait, is that really true? I mean, suppose that I'm trying to make a decision, caffeinated or decaffeinated. And instead of like going and working through like, you know, which is better, excitement or calm, okay? Instead, I just can't make up my mind. So what I do is I take out a coin, I flip the coin, heads is caffeine, tails is 
decaf, ah, its heads all have caffeine. Am I really making the decision by adding chance to this? I would actually say that, in fact, by adding this chance element, I'm abdicating my decision. I'm giving up my agency as the decider. I'm making the coin the decider. So somehow having some kind of you know, extra chanciness isn't actually helping. I mean, it explains why we don't know what the decision is going to be beforehand, but it doesn't fit with our experience of not knowing what we're going to do beforehand, not knowing our decision beforehand. So why is it that deciders don't know what they're going to decide? It actually comes from a very deep mathematical theorem. So in uh, uh, the 1930s, uh, the Austrian logician, Kurt Gödel, uh, uh, came up with a result that stunned the world of mathematics and of logic in particular. Up till that point, for thousands of years really, people thought, well, if we just come up with the right axioms, we'll be able to derive everything, like Euclid with his axioms for geometry, though of course Lobachevsky showed that, you know, that one of them, parallel lines not meeting, is optional. Uh, and so you could have non-Euclidean geometries. And at the beginning of the 20th century, David Hilbert, the famous German mathematician, said, let's just axiomatize all of mathematics with just a finite set that we can get everything from it. And what Gödel showed is that this is not possible. He did it by coming up with a clever and kind of brain-twisting argument that's a, uh, it's a variation on um, what's called the Cretan liar paradox. So the Cretan liar paradox comes from the Bible. St. Paul writes to Timothy, who's going to preach among the Cretans. He said, watch out for those Cretans. Why, one of their own philosophers says, uh, all Cretans are liars, gluttons, and drunks. So, but if all Cretans are liars, then how do you, what, how do you treat the statement of a Cretan who says, I am a liar? So what Gödel did is he, he constructed an analog of this sentence that no matter what I tell you, I'm lying. It's kind of a paradox. And what he did is he, he constructed a statement that said, essentially, this statement cannot be proved to be true. So he constructed a theorem, a theory with axioms and stuff. And then this theory, he constructed a statement that essentially said this statement cannot be proved to be true. That is, this statement cannot be derived in a logical fashion from the axioms of the theory. So there's two possibilities here. One is that the statement is false. That is, it can be proved to be true. But now you have a false statement that can be derived from the axioms of the theory. And that's bad because a theory where you can prove false statements is not a good theory. It's not consistent. You don't want to use those theories. So the other option is that the statement is true. But if it's true, it can't be proved to be true. It can't be derived from the axioms of the theory. Now, what's going on there? So, uh, shortly after Gödel came up with this famous mind-bending Gödel's incompleteness theorem, as it's called, Alan Turing, the inventor of the computer, um, was able to come up with a computational version of this. And he basically said, let's come up with a model of computation where bits are flipping and our computer is processing information in a systematic fashion. And let me define a universal computer to be one that can simulate any other computer. So you can program this computer to simulate any other computer. And he showed that in the case of digital computation that such computers exist. And in fact, we're very familiar with this because this feature that you know one pro computer can be programmed to simulate another computer is the very essence of being able to run different software on different computers, or the same software on different computers. You know. A Mac will run Microsoft Word, and so will a PC. And this, in effect, is the essence of, of Turing's statement. It's because they're both universal computers, so they can both do this. But if a computer, a universal com computer, can simulate any other computer, it can also simulate itself. So it can simulate what itself will do. In particular, it can ask the questions, what am I going to be doing a few minutes hence? Or if I have a decision to make, you know, maybe not calf or decaf in the case of a computer, but perhaps, you know, keep going or shut down, right? <laughs> what will I do? And Turing was able to show that this, these kinds of self-contradictory, self-referential statements, in Gödel's case, the statement, this theorem can't be proved, in the case 
of computers that have the capacity for self-reference, it means that the computer itself will not be able to predict what decision it's going to make. This is called the halting problem. He said, can the computer predict, will it ever stop and give an answer? And he showed no, there's no way that a computer can stop and give an answer. So in the theorem which I've proved, which is an analog of Turing's and Gödel's theorems, but proved for essentially for all physical systems by just taking the laws of physics, applying math, which are mathematically expressed, applying them to then, I can prove that any physical system that is making a decision, any decider that has to decide what it's going to do, including questions like, hmm, calf or decaf, if it's going through any kind of process to make the decision and asking the question, what decision will I make in the future, the decider will not be able to know. Because if you have the capacity for self-reference, the capacity to say, what am I going to be doing you know, five minutes down the line, what decision I will make, then you can prove mathematically that you must not be able to figure out what that decision will be. Ironically, this is true whether neuroscientists, or for that matter, your wife, know what decision it is you're going to make. Now, this raises a very interesting question about you know, whether things like human beings or iPhones uh, uh, have free will. Now, I don't know the answer to this because I don't know exactly what free will is. People still argue about free will. But what I do know is that if you ask your iPhone, you know, what decision it's going to make in terms of directing you to a particular restaurant, calling your spouse, or uh, uh, finding out where you are, uh, it won't know what that decision is going to be beforehand. I don't know whether computers and iPhones have free will, but in this one essential feature that they don't know what decision they're going to make, then computers and iPhones do have free will.